Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you for taking your time and staying for one of the last sessions in the KubeCon. Hope everyone had a great time and maybe, and I'm hopeful to see you maybe on the next one and we can discuss more. But today we have one of the last sessions. Uh, let's finish it with some secrets for, of running at CD. Uh, I'm Marek Sharkovic. Uh, I'm uh, uh, I've been a maintainer of etcd for the last two years uh, <clears throat> with recent creation of SIG etcd, the special interest group uh, in Kubernetes. I'm the TL of the, uh, of the SIG and I'm also the person uh, working at GKE and making sure that if you run in, G in, in Google, your, cluster, your Kubernetes clusters are running and the etcd that we are running is the best that we can bring you. So today I wanted to share some of the experiences and my view on reliability of etcd that I have seen personally in production. Um, so, uh, agenda for today is look at some simple cases of failures in distributed system. Uh, I would want to focus on, especially on cluster scope failures, which is, in my experience, biggest reason of uh, failures that I have seen. Uh, I will propose a couple of mitigations, how you can avoid uh, th those problems. And we'll finish maybe with the secret. Maybe some people already know it. Uh, and yeah, uh, so <clears throat> failures in distributed systems. Uh, Kuber uh, or etcd is really great at uh, handling failures of single members. Uh, this is because it uses a raft consensus algorithm and it allows it to survive uh, failures or of single, maybe two nodes, depending on your cluster size. So it, uh, as long as the quorum, so the majority of the members are alive, we can, we can, the cluster can proceed. And this is great for like failures of disk, network, some disconnections. So sh short, temporary, uh, <clears throat> issues that you don't want to like think like uh, about. Uh, but uh, so this works because of Raft. Uh, Raft is an algorithm that can take uh, um, any number of concurrent requests and provide us a singular, organized, and ordered stream of uh, of requests and properly distributed along all members. This allows us to be sure that every member has the same data and every member uh, can end up uh, in the same state. But unfortunately, it also means that uh, every time there is a developer mistake, application issue, or just a corrupt, even a corruption in the data, it's as easily to replicate a correct behavior, it's as, uh, or it's as easily to inject failure to all the members. So today I would want to give you a couple of examples of errors like this where the whole cluster can suffer because of some issue that was either uh, <clears throat> hard to predict in etcd uh, or Kubernetes has some problems with using uh, etcd in a way that would uh, ma ma make it more reliable or even issues that we could not predict uh, at all and are in the Golang language itself. Yeah, so I would want to start with pretty uh, simple case. I think everyone that runs Kubernetes uh, uh, heard about events and used the events, but uh, as stable as Kubernetes is, it still has, even, uh, or there is a lot of people that still have issues with uh, storing and persisting events uh, reliably. Uh, here, I would want to discuss directly a case that you can easily, or how Kubernetes uses events can easily lead to, to production uh, downtime if you don't handle them properly. So what is a Kubernetes event? Uh, <coughs> Kubernetes stores two types of distinguished 
uh, resources into the uh, etcd. One is objects that represent the state, the, the, the intent and the, and the status of, of what is happening in your cluster. Uh, they, they are of critical importance, so we cannot. If we need to persist them, and we need to guarantee of their their delivery. They are never deleted until we want them. Like something, we want them deleted. So either intent of the uh, developer changes or administrator, or they are garbage collected because they are no longer needed. And if you run of clusters of certain size, we can easily predict number of, uh, of objects that are running in um, cluster because you can multiply number of your nodes by some number of pods you run per node and maybe add some deployments. And there is some multiplication that you can give a high limit. On the other hand is events. And events is a, a, a way for developers that deploy on Kubernetes to get access to, uh, to debug information that usually only administrator can, can, uh, can see. So when there is a decision by scheduler uh, of, and it failed because there is no node in the cluster that matches I know, pod selector, the, this is what selector was chosen is the decision of developer. So Kubernetes makes it really easy for developer to see and run kubectl describe to, to see why, why the some pod was not scheduled. And uh, having those log logs is very, very useful for debugging, but uh, some of the properties of those logs are different than the state. So they are not critical, important, their best effort. So Kubernetes will even intentionally drop and avoid sending them if it, it's run out of resources or there is some network issue. So like FYI, you should not use events because they're not guaranteed delivery, so they're not critical uh, and you cannot make, you, you cannot always depend that they're uh, available. Uh, usually I think they're, um, configured to be deleted after two hours. This can change depending on your re release or uh, distribution of Kubernetes you run. And uh, they have tendency to really explode uh, there, uh, when there is some failure because if there is an issue with a couple of nodes, they get disconnected. You get uh, a lot of information or events, not only about the nodes, you get about the pods that they cannot schedule, and then you get about uh, deployments that they cannot get number of pods that they requested. So there is a, a big bump of, of or uh, you, you, they, aggregate mostly during failures, and one failure can easily lead to another one, and they can really uh, grow in size. Um, and the problem with uh, or Kubernetes events is that they are using etcd leases, and they are using it in somewhat uh, incorrect way. Uh, and this is because uh, leases were designed as a short, uh, short, um, short uh, uh, for short time, to allow etcd to provide distributed uh, primitives like leader election. So for times like five, ten seconds, and it doesn't. And this requirement. Um, Mean, uh, mean, or means that etcd doesn't really persist their, um, their st status. So when the lease is created, we save its TTL, but uh, we don't do any updates or any checkpoints uh, uh, for throughout the time of the lease. And during this time, etcd members uh, can go down, up, and leader can change. And because etcd leases are only counted down uh, by the leader, every time that your leader gets disconnected from the cluster, it's an easy case for uh, the time, uh, the lease time can, to be reset. And Kubernetes directly uh, uses leases to provide the TTL for events. So if leases 
uh, if the leader changes and least timeout is reset, your events that should be deleted like half an hour ago can still uh, leave for another hour. Um, yeah, so two hours make it really, really uh, unfortunate. And every time that there is a leader election uh, or leader change, the number of leases can grow exponentially. And a couple of unf unfortunate events can cause a full explosion and domino effect uh, uh, around the size of etcd. And this, uh, <coughs> this like, cannot be really uh, uh, avoided on the default uh, Kubernetes clusters. Or, uh, so you need to configure and make direct changes to, to, or to your uh, distribute or how do you architect Kubernetes or how do you run your control plane and how you configure your etcd to, to, to handle it. So because events are best effort and not really uh, a durable critical thing for your cluster, you should really think about separating the etcd instance that stores them, making uh, it much easy to, to be not persistent. Uh, this allows your cluster, if it even goes down, uh, because of events to be then rebooted uh, uh, with, without the bloat of leases causing the, uh, the consistent downtime. Um, <clears throat> the way, if you're making, uh, or if you still want to persist information that is available events, you can easily watch or there are ready solution to export events to your uh, logging solution like Elasticsearch or your preferred cloud. Uh, you, you can reduce the TTL to like five minutes, which makes it much uh, more re uh, re resilient to failures, and then uh, have a separate process that watches them and exports them to your uh, logging solution so developers can still read them and look through historical, uh, down um, historical debug historical issues. And um, a new thing that was introduced uh, around a year ago is the list checkpointing. It's a direct fix in etcd to make Kubernetes use case reliable. And it, uh, it has two iterations uh, that uh, in first prevents, you, prevents leader election from causing uh, uh, TTL to be reset by having uh, every five minutes uh, leader sending an update and checkpoint to other members that, hey, like we, we, I counted down in five minutes, please remember this and reduce your uh, TTL. And second was is persisting. So if your whole etcd cluster goes down, persist will, will make sure that this uh, this checkpoint is not only in memory in the members, but it's also on the disk. So even if you shut down your full cluster, the time will be persisted on the disk. So <clears throat> second issue that I would want to discuss is about a Kubernetes quota deadlock. I, uh, if you ever looked into uh, if you ever looked into how etcd stores data on the disk and ever found uh, or encountered an issue that etcd cannot or Kubernetes cannot progress because etcd um, complains about out of quota, uh, this uh, this is uh, the mechanism that is underlying. So the etcd stores both the latest state and the history of. Uh, history of, of all changes that happened. So there's two dimensions to, to, to every um, to, to, to size of the database. And <clears throat> this is uh, a mechanism to prevent uh, regression in performance on etcd. Uh, and if you've ever either increased or, or if either state of your etcd or grew 
too much or number you haven't or number of changes has increased you might run into issue that etcd will hit the database size limit and in that situation etcd will raise an alarm and require someone to re uh, remove the uh, unnecessary information and uh, release the uh, the quota alarm um, <clears throat> Let's now look at two mechanisms driving the size of etcd. The first one is compaction. Uh, it's a mechanism that uh, is responsible for cutting and removing uh, long tail of changes in etcd that are no longer uh, access, accessed or useful to be accessed. It just, uh, it takes uh, a full history of all resource version in, uh, that, uh, in Kubernetes that might be used, and it uh, marks one revision as unavailable. And from that, and this allows etcd to then clean up the uh, old revisions and reduce the data space. And second mechanism that drives uh, the size of the database is the defragmentation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, etcd algorithm for selecting pages, selecting and using disk space is still around Windows uh, 95, which means we, uh, from time to time, you need to defrag. It's less about the performance, to, like based on my experience, it's more about uh, the size of the storage never decreases. So for your like sanity and you making sure that the uh, quota doesn't increase and you're not feel pressure that you're getting close to it, you should defrag your etcd uh, to prevent uh, unoptimized uh, page layout. <clears throat> so the two mechanisms uh, work together to reduce size of etcd. First, uh, usually you would have your uh, at, um, most of your um, storage pretty utilized uh, with only a couple of uh, empty spaces and all the revisions uh, used. If you then compact that, you can remove uh, the revisions below. So here, the, if we compact on revision 10, uh, we would remove the pages that have the data for those, uh, for those revisions, leading to s even more empty spaces. And then you, we need to uh, run a defrag for etcd to rewrite the, st uh, the page layout and end out at the minimal size of database that is required. <clears throat> so going into the problem, uh, Kubernetes compaction is somewhat unaware of uh, some proper uh, or some etcd behaviors and uh, can uh, cause a lot of problem. The, the algorithm that Kubernetes uses is, uh, is assuming that there are multiple API servers talking to etcd and those multi uh, uh, multiple API servers are racing uh, to to do the compaction and to prevent unnecessary compaction or uh, those uh, and those two API servers to, uh, um, interfering with each other, they are first trying to race for a change onto the key. So they make a write and the one that uh, is first will uh, wins and can do the compaction. This has an obvious issue of what happens if you run out of quota? We cannot make a write. Kubernetes just stops. It cannot proceed. So what you should do to prevent this? Uh, Kubernetes algorithm is not perfect, but there's, there is for a long time a solution in etcd that not only avoids the problem, but reduces the overall overhead of, of your etcd. Um, <clears throat> by default, Kubernetes algorithms uh, stores data between five and 10 minutes uh, 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 of all historical changes. If, uh, and this, if you only set the compaction period for five minutes. So you can double the size. Uh, by default, you can, the size of etcd can be double the data necessary by Kubernetes. And if you 
use the HD mechanism, you will only have uh, around 10% overhead. So we can double the how, you, how much you get space from HCD by just setting a flag on HCD and disabling it in Kubernetes. Uh, second recommendation I would do is on defrag. Uh, defrag is very expensive, uh, expensive and you should uh, avoid it if possible. I, uh, maybe depending on your experience, you've seen some performance improvement, but uh, in my experience, they're not big enough to, uh, <clears throat> to motivate running defrag too frequently. You should defrag. Uh, you should defrag when you, sh <clears throat> or you should execute always the defrag as uh, as only when it's. Uh, you should execute defrag when it's appropriate and check this pretty frequently. But you should avoid locking, uh, making the database unavailable because defrag itself requires a full lock on database and rewriting the storage. So you can avoid this cost by, by the, just adding some uh, simple checks before running it that uh, we uh, that verify that there is at least some space to be freed before you uh, and uh, before you execute the defrag. So by running it pretty frequently, you can with the check you can avoid the downside of locking the database too much but still ensure that you don't run out of quota too, too, uh, too fast. Um, one thing to remember, you should at the end also uh, dis disarm the uh, alarm because from time to time maybe it, you will get into a situation that you reach the quota and you want to be sure that the alarm after defrag is uh, disarmed and you can do automa safely automate that if you're running defrag. Mm. Uh, the third issue that I wanted to discuss is the most like recent critical issue in that was in etcd pr project uh, it's about etcd what starvation so to understand how the what starvation can happen especially in kubernetes we need to look a little bit into um, uh, into uh, Kubernetes. So there is what Kubernetes does is there is a single etcd client per resource. Sorry for the mistake. Uh, so if you have multiple controllers uh, like scheduler, AP, controller manager, they will all talk to Kubernetes API. But at the end, this will be grouped by each resource and uh, um, which has its own separate storage uh, structure, uh, Golang structure. And those will, uh, and each client will run independent uh, gRPC connection to to etcd. Uh, the important part is uh, the, that if there is uh, a lot of traffic on single resource, they are all sent through one connection. Mm. So uh, the issue that I encountered uh, myself was. Uh, a simple change uh, of enabling TL, uh, TLS that caused uh, a what starvation. Um, it was a pretty hard to discover issue because uh, we've been rolling out the, the change for a very long time and only one cluster out of <laughs> only one cluster after a year encountered it to, to total surprise to, uh, of everyone. Um, what was unique about this cluster what, was that there was a lot of uh, daemon set co controllers uh, that, or con uh, demo of controllers running as daemon set because if you ha want to have some logging setup and you want to n add some metadata about pods, you will uh, have your I know, FluentD or Fluent Bit talk to API server. And if there is a, a lot of, or, or if there is a uh, short downtime, those uh, no, uh, of those nodes, they can, they will, will want to reconnect to API server, and they will start it from making a list request. And this can, if there is a pretty big cluster, this can cause a lot of traffic on the uh, on the wire. 
And if all of those requests are about pods, the traffic on the etcd client for pods will be will be pre, pre, uh, will will be overwhelming the gRPC connection. And this happened because etcd uh, w is serving uh, the serving stack has a separate paths for both TLS and non-TLS. And the underlying issue is that HTTP2 standard doesn't allow multiplexing of TLS connection. You cannot easily, dis you cannot even distinguish it at all between, uh, during the protocol negotiation, whether it is a TL, uh, HTTP request or gRPC request, and whether, uh, <clears throat> so it requires you to, to proxy through someone. So for if there is a, so normally for non-TLS case, we can just uh, check uh, we can just check on connection level and send HTTP request to HTTP server and uh, gRPC request to gRPC server that run as separate go routines. But in TLS case, uh, we, be, because we cannot distinguish them, we need to send the, the TLS request to HTTP server and it will pr uh, pass if there is a gRPC um, protocol header, it will pass it to gRPC handler. And there is a big difference between, uh, before the, uh, between those two uh, solutions. The HTTP, maybe, the, or the protocol HTTP2 is the same, but the impl implementation is totally different. Uh, <clears throat> uh, even in gRPC uh, documentation, it, stands, uh, it states that performance and features between those two uh, solutions may can really vary and what happens is or what happened in our case was that because http2 supports multiple streams per writer uh, it it also needs to pick uh, algorithm to decide which stream to respond uh, which streams to respond first. So if there is a two list requests at the same time, there's algorithm that will pick whether to respond to the first list or the second list. And this, uh, the same happens uh, with the watch. So if there is a lot of list requests, uh, GR, uh, or the HTTP server needs to have some way to decide who to respond, uh, who is the, in which order it should respond. And unfortunately, that the main difference between a gRPC and HTTP uh, server was that HTTP server didn't, uh, not only didn't prioritize the watch, which is much smaller requests that are less frequent, but it also uh, even worked against it and made it always, uh, it resulted in this, uh, in watch being always at the end of the queue, causing a full starvation that can, like, that could take minutes to clock out. So if there was multiple, um, if there were multiple uh, list requests concurrently and one watch, the watch could never get, uh, uh, could be hanging there waiting for a event and can be, uh, there could be minutes passing and it will not get any update. And because of how Kubernetes reconciliation loop works, this causes total chaos because you deploy a pod, you, you create it, and nothing happens. And all controllers don't, don't observe this. Um, so <clears throat> uh, the fix, unfortunately, was pretty involved, required re-implementation uh, and collaboration between uh, both uh, etcd and uh, Kubernetes scalability and Golang teams to improve the, uh, to make the algorithm handle the watch properly. Uh, at the end, we only recently have update, <laughs> provided an update to the, um, to the etcd that include this fix. Um, but because it's, it, it took us a long time and we knew that it's not an easy fix, we needed to have an immediate mitigation. So if you're running older, um, older version of etcd or 
yeah, if you're running older version of etcd, maybe you can use the client uh, mitigate or mitigation mitigation by separating gRPC and, and HTTP uh, server. And thus allowing uh, the multiplex or thus skipping the issue with uh, gRPC request going through HTTP server. Uh, to detect if you are interested if you can have this issue or if you can hit this issue in your uh, clusters, I really recommend monitoring, uh, monitoring those two uh, metrics. So we discussed a couple of failures and you can see the pattern that all, all of them are cluster level. There was no thing that etcd could done without of help of either operators or, uh, or proper SRE meta mitigation. And for those issues, etcd, it's only up to you to set up uh, your cluster properly to, and to mitigate. Uh, you should not think that, or you should not assume that Kubernetes gives you 100% uh, reliability and 100% um, protection about uh, from, con from developer failures. So any change to your cluster can lead to, uh, uh, lead to a problem that you may be not discovered. So putting all your eggs in one basket can end up pretty pretty badly. So my suggestion would be to separate your cluster and run, run them as, uh, or minimize your blast, blast radius. So if you have an issue with one cluster that you've never, um, never experienced, you should think about having either a, a second that can re, uh, take over your traffic or have an easy way and documented way to mitigate and recreate a new cluster in its place. <clears throat> uh, because it's better to uh, to have partial downtime th than be totally, uh, and maybe some performance uh, or latency increase than being totally uh, down. Uh, second way to, to handle such issues is to do a canary rollout. So the same like blue-green deployment, you can... Uh, you should treat every change as a potential disruption to your cluster. Any like etcd upgrade, any, any Kubernetes upgrade, any of your application that, uh, uh, upgrade that maybe has some new traffic pattern that is abusive to etcd uh, should be, to, uh, if you treat all those changes as a black box and roll out them independently, it should allow you to uh, be able to discover the issues uh, early and, me cont and contain them. And if, uh, the, the third iteration of the idea would be to, to think about changes as, uh, yeah, think uh, all changes as a disruption and uh, qualifying and sulking all of your changes that are coming to, to your cluster. And you can validate if, uh, or you can minimize the risk by separating your uh, clusters into groups of different criticality and assigning them uh, a multi-phase rollout uh, and having a, a direct qualification targets for each, each um, part of your fleet. And this is especially what GKE does by separating uh, their fleet in, into channels and allowing customers to pick it, which channel w or what kind of disturbance in your service you can tolerate. So you can run your test clusters in the first phase and we can qualify the um, and the etcd in the first phase on the test cluster and not cause any cause only minimal issues uh, and, and avoid production impact so all of those solutions are a standard application um, <clears throat> mitigation to to failures and there is nothing new uh, that that I proposed, and uh, so 
the main maybe problem with them, not everyone can run multiple clusters. Not everyone can, can take the cost of running them. So what's the <coughs> alternative approach? What is the secret? And for me, uh, all of the, uh, like my understanding is all of those issues were discussed and available publicly. You could read them, you can verify them. And the Etsy, like for example, Kubernetes events issue was there, uh, was there for years uh, as a default sub, uh, separating the HD events uh, was a solution available for years. And I still see people coming to me and asking about how to handle uh, events properly. So uh, for me, there is like one uh, observation that people treat open source as a ready uh, s solution that you can just skip your skip your uh, a lot of experience uh, or skip gathering experience and take a, a free beer out of the shelf and treat it as a uh, um, treat it as a solution uh, to for for follow your reliability and unfortunately this is not true uh, open source is mostly about the freedom to exchange ideas, share them, and learn together. So when you think about running a CD, uh, you should either uh, you should invest your your time into uh, knowing how co uh, open source community runs it and making sure that you're uh, avoiding common pitfalls by going outside of the uh, common paths that etcd has been tested for a long long time uh, so etcd is a, a production grade key value store but only you can make it production ready and uh, <clears throat> most of the issues that I discussed, their solutions cannot be baked into open source because they re require full uh, re re um, redesign or re-architecture or of Kubernetes cluster. And you should take it account and think about how do you, uh, how do you make sure that, um, that you can use or that you, how you can make sure that you uh, you're know all the common pitfalls. So uh, for me, the best way for that was uh, to tap the collective uh, community experience. Uh, most, or, uh, most people I talk to still run etcd versions that are, have uh, been known to have uh, corruptions and been multi time. Uh, uh, have been multiple emails announcing problems with them and not and they're still uh, not follow or there are still many people that don't follow it so my recommendation would be you will save you yourself a lot of time to just know what is community doing and what is the discussion and we do a full announcement about the issues so you should follow the etsy mailing list uh, if you have any questions or any problems, uh, or you go a little out of the tested and verified dimensions of etcd or Kubernetes, you should first, or you should ask questions and make sure that uh, that you double check with the, uh, you double check what is opinion and what people have already done, because you're not you're not unique in what you're doing. There are definitely people that have done it before. If you just ask them, they will be happy to share what they did. And be sure to sh share your experience, share, uh, experience yourself and file an issue and talk about it so we can collaboratively debug and help you get uh, what you want. So in summary, uh, cluster scope failures are a thing, so you should plan for them. You should understand what can happen badly if you don't, uh, if, uh, or you should assume that things can go wrong and you should have a plan how, how is, will be your reaction and uh, you should also test it. Um, there is a lot of known issues and 
Uh, most of them require, unfortunately require a mitigation because of backward in, uh, incompatibility or require you to change your uh, architecture of, uh, or how you run your cluster. And my main suggestion would be don't try to figure out your, everything yourself. Tap the community, uh, collective community experience and uh, talk to us so we can, uh, so we can learn together. Uh, that's all from me. Sorry for running out of time. Uh, if you have any feedback, uh, here's the QR code. Um, there are still some stickers at the front uh, seat if you want. There are also some chocolates from the speaker. 